And now chapter 7, the battle between Shalva and the members of the Yadu dynasty. While Shukdev Goswami was narrating various activities of Lord Krishna in playing the role of an ordinary human being, he also narrated the history of the battle between the dynasty of Yadu and a demon of the name Shalva, who had managed to possess a wonderful airship named Soba. King Shalva was a great friend of Shishupal's. When Shishupal went to marry Rukmini, Shalva was one of the members of the bridegroom's party. In the fight between the soldiers of the Yadu dynasty and the kings of the opposite side, Shalva was defeated by the soldiers of the Yadu dynasty. But despite his defeat, he made a promise before all the kings that he would, in the future, rid the whole world of all the members of the Yadu dynasty. Since his defeat in the fight during the marriage of Rukmini, he had maintained within himself an unforgettable envy of Lord Krishna, and he was in fact a fool because he had promised to kill Krishna. Usually such foolish demons take shelter of a demigod like Lord Shiva to execute their ulterior plans. And so in order to get strength, Shalva took refuge at the lotus feet of Lord Shiva. He underwent a severe type of austerity during which he would eat no more than a handful of ashes daily. Lord Shiva, the husband of Parvati, is generally very merciful and he is very quickly satisfied if someone undertakes severe austerities to please him. So after continued austerities by Shalva for one year, Lord Shiva became pleased with him and asked him to beg for the fulfillment of his desire. Shalva begged from Lord Shiva the gift of an airplane which would be so strong that it could not be destroyed by any demigod, demon, human being, Gandharva, Naga, or even Rakshasa. Moreover, he desired that the airplane be able to fly anywhere and everywhere he would like to pilot it, and be specifically very dangerous and fearful to the dynasty of the Yadus. Lord Shiva immediately agreed to give him the benediction, and Shalva took the help of the demon Maya to manufacture this iron airplane, which was so strong and formidable that no one could crash it. It was a very big machine, almost like a big city, and it could fly so high and at such a great speed that it was almost impossible to see, and so there was no question of attacking it. Although the night might be dark outside, the pilot could fly anywhere and everywhere. Having acquired such a wonderful airplane, Shalva flew it to the city of Dvorka, because his main purpose in obtaining the airplane was to attack the city of the Yadus, toward whom he maintained a constant feeling of animosity. Shalva thus attacked the city of Dvorka from the sky, and he also surrounded the city by a large number of infantry. The soldiers on the surface attacked the beautiful spots of the city. They began to destroy the nice parks, the city gates, the palaces, and the skyscraper houses, the high walls around the city, and the beautiful spots where people would gather for recreation. While the soldiers attacked on the surface, the airplane began to drop big slabs of stone, tree trunks, thunderbolts, poisonous snakes, and many other dangerous things. Shalva also managed to create such a strong whirlwind within the city that all of Dvorka became dark because of the dust that covered the sky. The airplane occupied by Shalva put the entire city of Dvorka into distress equal to that caused on the earth long, long ago by the disturbing activities of Tripurasura. 
the inhabitants of Dvorkapuri became so harassed that they were not peaceful for even a moment. The great heroes of Gorka city, headed by commanders such as Pradyumna, counterattacked the soldiers and airplane of Shalva. When he saw the extreme distress of the citizens, Pradyumna immediately arranged his soldiers and personally got up on a chariot, encouraging the citizens by assuring safety. Following his command, many warriors like Satyaki, Charudeshna, and Samba, all young brothers of Pradyumna, as well as Akrura, Kritavarma, Banuvinda, Gad, Suk, and Sharan, all came out of the city to fight with Shalva. All of them were great fighters. Each one could fight with thousands of men. All were fully equipped with necessary weapons and assisted by hundreds and thousands of charioteers, elephants, horses, and infantry soldiers. Fierce fighting began between the two parties, exactly as formerly carried on between the demigods and the demons. The fighting was severe, and whoever observed the fierce nature of the fight felt his hairs stand on end. Pradyumna immediately counteracted the mystic demonstration occasioned by the airplane of Shalva, the king of Soba. By the mystic power of the airplane, Shalva had created a darkness as dense as night, but Pradyumna all of a sudden appeared like the rising sun. As with the rising of the sun, the darkness of night is immediately dissipated. With the appearance of Pradyumna, the power exhibited by Shalva became null and void. Each of Pradyumna's arrows had a golden feather at the end and the shaft was fitted with a sharp iron edge. By releasing 25 such arrows, Pradyumna severely injured Shalva's commander-in-chief. He then released another 100 arrows toward the body of Shalva. After this, he pierced each and every soldier by releasing one arrow. He killed the chariot drivers by firing 10 arrows at each of them and he killed the carriers like the horses and elephants by the release of three arrows directed toward each one. When everyone present on the battlefield saw this wonderful feat of Pradyumna's, the great fighters on both sides praised his acts of chivalry. But still the airplane occupied by Shalva was very mysterious. It was so extraordinary that sometimes many airplanes would appear to be in the sky, and sometimes there were apparently none. Sometimes the plane was visible, and sometimes not visible, and the warriors of the Yadu dynasty were puzzled about the whereabouts of the peculiar airplane. Sometimes they would see the airplane on the ground, sometimes flying in the sky, sometimes resting on the peak of a hill, and sometimes floating on the water. The wonderful airplane flew in the sky like a whirling firebrand. It was not steady even for a moment. But despite the mysterious maneuvering of the airplane, the commanders and soldiers of the Yadu dynasty would immediately rush toward Shalva, wherever he was present with his airplane and soldiers. The arrows released by the dynasty of the Yadus were as brilliant as the sun and as dangerous as the tongues of serpents. All the soldiers fighting on behalf of Shalva soon became distressed by the incessant release of arrows upon them by the heroes of the Yadu dynasty. And Shalva himself became unconscious from the attack of these arrows. The soldiers fighting on behalf of Shalva were also very strong, and the release of their arrows also harassed the heroes of the Yadu dynasty. But still the Yadus were so strong and determined that they did not move from their strategic positions. 
the heroes of the Yadu dynasty were determined either to die on the battlefield or to gain victory. They were confident that if they died in the fighting, they would attain a heavenly planet, and if they came out victorious, they would enjoy the world. The name of Shalva's commander-in-chief was Dumon. He was very powerful, and although bitten by twenty-five of Produmnia's arrows, he suddenly attacked Produmnia with his fierce club and struck him so strongly that Produmnia became unconscious. Immediately there was a roaring. Now he is dead! Now he is dead! The force of the club on Produmnia's chest was very severe, enough to tear asunder the chest of an ordinary man. Produmnia's chariot was being driven by the son of Daruk. According to Vedic military principles, the chariot driver and the hero on the chariot must cooperate during the fighting. As such, because it was the duty of the chariot driver to take care of the hero on the chariot during the dangerous and precarious fighting, he removed the body of Produmnia from the battlefield. Two hours later, in a quiet place, Produmnia regained his consciousness, and when he saw that he was in a place other than the battlefield, he addressed the charioteer and condemned him. Oh, you have done the most abominable act. Why have you moved me from the battlefield? My dear charioteer, I have never heard that anyone in our family was ever removed from the battlefield. None of them left the battlefield while fighting. By this removal, you have overburdened me with a great defamation. It will be said that I left the battlefield while fighting was going on. My dear charioteer, I must accuse you. You are a coward and emasculator. Tell me, how can I go before my uncle Balaram and my father Krishna, and what shall I say before them? Everyone will talk about me and say that I fled from the fighting place, and if they inquire from me about this, what will be my reply? My sister-in-laws will play jokes upon me with sarcastic words. My dear hero, how have you become such a coward? How have you become such a eunuch? How have you become so low in the eyes of the fighters who opposed you? I think, my dear charioteer, that you have committed a great offense by removing me from the battlefield. The charioteer of Prajumna replied, My dear sir, I wish a long life for you. I think that I did nothing wrong, for it is the duty of the charioteer to help the fighter in the chariot when he is in a precarious condition. My dear sir, you are completely competent in the battlefield, but it is the duty of the charioteer and the warrior to protect each other in a precarious condition. I was completely aware of the regular principles of fighting, and I did my duty. The enemy all of a sudden struck you with his club so severely that you lost consciousness. You are in a dangerous position, surrounded by your enemies. Therefore I was obliged to act as I did. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, seventh chapter of Krishna, the battle between Shalva and the members of the Yadu dynasty.